my name is Derek, you've heard a bit about me from the intro, and I'm a physician ear. So what that term means is, is that I've trained as an engineer, so I've done electronic computer, electronic computer biomedical engineering, and I've also trained as a physician or a doctor. So I've done my medical training and my clinical training in general medicine and in endocrinology and in diabetes. And as an engineer, half my brain is in black and white, so it's analytical, problem solving, very logical. And as a clinician, well, anyone who knows medicine knows it's a spectrum of color. Nothing's ever black and white in medicine. And the interesting thing is, is that doctors have a lot of clinical problems and engineers have lots of solutions. So if you put the two of them together, you have great opportunity for innovation. And I've been lucky in the last 20 years or so to be involved with some, some very innovative projects. So back in 2007, uh, NASA had a problem with monitoring how astronauts sleep in space. Because if you're in orbit and you're going around the Earth 16 times a day, that's 16 sunrises and sunsets. That's really bad jet lag. <laughs> so they had to figure out how they're sleeping rather than just saying, are you sleeping okay, subjectively. So we came up with an idea where we put a bio vest on the astronauts and we looked at their ECG and what's called their heart rate variability. And from that we could deduce their sleep stage and see the quality of sleep they were getting. So when you do an intervention, then you can see if it's effective or not. We've done projects where we've worked with patients who've had strokes and have had paralysis afterwards. We've built exoskeletons with electrical stimulation to allow them to walk more efficiently. And more recently, we've done work with people with type 1 diabetes, developing technology to deliver insulin automatically. So the idea of a clinical problem and an engineer being at the table and being involved with the solution is a very, very uh, innovative uh, mix. And tonight, I'm going to hopefully talk to you about that, where that mix of engineering and medicine is going in the future with the talk about digital doctors, the future of medicine. So this story starts actually here in Galway about four years ago. I was a doctor on a ward round in the hospital. And when you're on a ward round, you go around to see all your patients in the morning. So you see the patient and you ask them how they're, how they're doing, how the treatment is working. You check their vital signs, you look at the bloods, you look at the radiology. And then during the ward round, I get a phone call. And I answered the phone because it could be radiology ringing me with an updated report on the patient or it could be the labs ringing me about an updated blood result. So I took the phone call and somebody said, hi, is this Dr. O'Keefe? And I said, yes. Is this you, Dad? <laughs> and they said, oh, this is uh, actually NASA. We have a NEMO mission next summer and we're wondering if you'd like to be part of it because part of the mission brief is telemedicine and you did things with telemedicine with us a few years ago. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, I'm in the middle of something at the moment, uh, can I ring you back later? And they were like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I hung up the phone and I turned back to the team and they were like, uh, who was on the phone? Uh, I was like, it was NASA. Uh, uh, and they were like, yeah, sure it was, yeah. So. But it, it actually was NASA. Uh, and, and for those who don't know who NASA is, if you haven't watched any movies or been involved with society in the last 50 years, NASA is the US federal agency that's kind of tasked with manned space flight. And they have a big year this year. This year is the 50th anniversary of putting a man on the moon this July. So you're going to hear a lot about NASA and their achievements this year. And they've done some phenomenal stuff over the last 50 years of manned space flight. You're aware, obviously, of the, of the shuttle program and the robotic missions and so on. But what NASA really have done for us as a society is develop new technologies and new protocols for us as, as humans and push the boundaries of science. And one thing they do really well in NASA, uh, and the, one of the reasons of their success, is what's called the three Ps. So that's practice, practice, practice. Very good. Okay. So what they asked me to do in NASA <laughs> is they asked me to get involved with one of their practice sessions. So they have these facilities around planet Earth whereby they take a habitat, which we're going to hopefully put on the lunar surface or the Martian surface, and they take this habitat and they put it in what's called an extreme environment. And those extreme environments are in the high Arctic where there's snow and you know, high winds. They're on the lava fields of, of Hawaii. They're in the deserts of the Mojave. And the one that I was invited to be involved with was underwater off the coast of Florida. It's called the Aquarius Habitat. It's about 60 feet down, which is double the height of a two-story house. It's about 10 kilometers off the coast of Florida. And this pretty much bus-sized sunken laboratory is where four astronauts live for a month every year in what's called NEMO, the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operation. And the idea of these four astronauts living there, or aquanauts, as they're called underwater, uh, for the month is that during that month they can do science and engineering experiments and they can develop the protocols here on Earth before we put that base on the Moon and Mars. 
And you might say, well, why do they want to put it in such an inhospitable environment? But that's the key. That makes the simulation high fidelity. Because if something is wrong, you can't just pop outside and leave the habitat. If you forget something, you can't just pop outside to the local store and get it. You really have to plan the mission and you have to be in the moment in the mission. So it allows us to test protocols and techniques and technology in a high fidelity scenario. So, so why did they want me? That was the question, I guess. So I rang them back and I said, yeah, I'm actually available next summer. What's the, what's the mission? And they said, we have this idea, you know, we've been doing telemedicine and remote monitoring for a while at NASA, but the NEMO mission this year, we have an interesting idea. We want to make mission decisions based on physiological data. And I was like, all right, that sounds interesting. So usually there's a flight surgeon, which is the physician that looks after the health of the astronauts or aquanauts. But this was the flight surgeon actually inputting into mission decisions. So the idea would be is that the aquanauts underwater would wear something like a bio vest that would measure their heart rate, their ECG, their respiratory rate, their movement, and so on. And then with that activity, then we could actually make decisions. So for example, I was able to talk to one of the, the crew, Dr. Marco Grifa, and I'd say to him, you know, you're planning today on the mission schedule to go outside the habitat today to do extravehicular activity. And there's a choice of four people that you can pick. But I've been looking at the physiological data for the last 24 hours, and I think you should pick aquanaut number two. Because aquanaut number one, they haven't slept so well the last three nights. And aquanaut number three, they're developing a temperature, so they're probably going to get a flu. So we made a mission decision based on physiological objective data. And that's a very interesting concept. And it's kind of a tease of where we're going to go in medicine. So as I said, when you're outside the habitat, you have to be at your physical and mental best. And that's why it's really important that you use data to make the decisions and not just ask somebody how they feel. And this technology was 2015, this kind of concept. And it's starting to creep in now to what we call elite sports. So elite, you know, soccer in the premiership or football, basketball, all the top sports of the world. What you're starting to see now is a lot of the players in the training ground wearing this kind of technology, both to assess how they're performing and then also on the day when they're playing sports. The next level, of course, which is going to become more common if it's not there already, is that a lot of these elite athletes will be expected to wear this equipment all the time, not just when they're in training, not just when they're playing the game. So now on a Friday night when a coach makes a decision about a big international the next day, he says, okay, not only is this player playing well during the week in training, I can see that they've been in bed every night at 10 o'clock, they've got their eight hours sleep, they haven't gone to too many nightclubs. So that's what's going to be expected of the elite sports person because what's going to happen is on the Friday night when you're picking your team, you want to pick the best, the best 11. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's just take that idea and go forward it again, another five years. And then you're coming into the world of us, the consumers. So you're all familiar with wearable technology. Most of us here probably have some intelligent band on our wrist that me measures our step count or tells us our calories. We have smart watches. We have phones in our pockets that are computers a thousand times more powerful than that Apollo mission in 1969. But the big game changer in the next few years is going to be smart fabrics. This has already been developed in some research labs, but it just hasn't hit widespread consumer uh, market yet. And what that basically means is your t-shirt will have fibers in it that will be measuring your physiological signals. So you'll be sitting there and you'll get a text message from your t-shirt. <laughs> and it'll say, hey, John, you're getting a temperature. I see you've got tickets booked tomorrow night for the cinema. I'd probably pass on it. <laughs> so this is, this is interesting. This is where the technology is going. The idea of wearable tech ultimately making decisions with our lives. And then the important thing in all of that discussion is the engine behind those decisions. Because all this wearable technology is just data. That doesn't do anything. What you need is information. And from the information, then you get knowledge. And that's the second part of the talk. So the first part is remote monitoring, which I hope you've followed me on the journey. The next part is the artificial intelligence. So we've all heard this term, artificial intelligence. We're familiar with it, I hope, in our lives, whereby you're watching a music video on the internet, and maybe it makes a suggestion of what video you should watch next. And then you watch it, and you kind of go, oh, that was pretty cool, I didn't know that artist. So it's kept you in the same thematic area. But it's going to get stronger, and it's going to make our lives more interesting. So for example, in the United States at the moment, and indeed in Ireland more recently, if you imagine young drivers, they get penalized a lot with insurance policies because typically young drivers, you know, they tend to have more accidents because they may not understand the risks involved with their behaviors. But now you can get an electronic device that you can plug into your actual car. 
So any car built since or the mid-90s has a diagnostic port for mechanics. This device plugs into it, and it monitors your behavior as a driver. So if you turn right and you indicate right, that's a good thing. If you drive between the hours of 8 and 8 and it's daylight, that's good. If you obey the speed limits, that's good. So if you have good behaviors, you get 10% off your premium. Brilliant. So it rewards people who have good driving behaviors and therefore have a lower chance of accidents. Now imagine the flip of that. So all that wearable technology I've just told you about that we'll all be wearing in five years' time or so, imagine if all that technology is harnessed and now it's a life insurance company or a health insurance company is looking at it. And it says, you know what, Jack, you're doing a fantastic job. You're going to bed every night at 10. You're getting up every morning at 8. You're getting a great sleep. <laughs> You're not going to the pub. <laughs> You're going to salad bars. You are living your best life. 10% off your health insurance policy. Now, Mary, you're going to bed every night at 10 o'clock, but you're watching Game of Thrones for three hours. You're falling asleep at 1 o'clock, you're waking up at 6, and then you're wondering why you're tired the next day, and you don't have time to prepare the food, so you're going to a fast food joint, and then you're so tired you can't go to the gym you're going to get a 10% loading on your premium. So do we really want that as a society? Because these are the kind of questions we're going to have to ask. It's creeping in already with the car insurance. But as a society, do we want to give that kind of access, I guess, to artificial intelligence? Now, we are creatures of habit. We know this. It's part of probably an evolutionary biology mechanism whereby we do things in patterns. And that's where artificial intelligence is really powerful, is when pattern recognition. It sees behaviors and it predicts the future based on patterns. So a patent was taken out last year by one of the large online shopping companies called Predictive Purchasing. And the idea is you can say $10, $20, or $50, and you can select once a week, once a month, or once a year. So we'll just say you say $50 once a month. And they're so confident with their artificial intelligence algorithms that they know what you want before you've even thought of it, that they'll give you free shipping if you don't want it. And I know what everyone's saying here. In their brain, they're saying, there's no way a computer knows what I want. I am a multifaceted, special, <laughs> sentient human being. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> we are all creatures of patterns. And as I said, it's probably something to do with, with our evolution, whereby if we used to walk a certain way back to the cave every night and we didn't get killed or attacked, we probably kept walking to the cave the same way every day. Most of us here probably drive the same way to work every day. We go to the same supermarket, we buy the same 20 things. So this new predictive purchasing um, software that's going to come online pretty soon, you've selected $50, you've selected once a month. You look at the calendar and you see it's the first of the month and you're going to go home and you're going to see this package on the table. And you're going to think to yourself, oh yeah, this is brilliant, now I'm going to show that artificial intelligence how special I am. And you're going to walk over to the table, you're going to pick up the box, open it and say, there's no way a computer, oh my goodness, this is amazing. This is exactly what I wanted. How did it know? So it knew because it got you a guidebook for France on the holidays. And it saw in your calendar that you're going to France this summer. And it also saw in your calendar that last year you were in Spain and you bought a guidebook in the same thematic style and you gave it a five-star rating. So it predicted that you'd want a guidebook for this year's holiday. Wow. Maybe computers do know us better than we know ourselves. So this is the kind of artificial intelligence that's going to be making big decisions, not only about our purchases, but also about our health. So imagine all that wearable technology I spoke to you about, and the computer is analyzing it, and it's saying, you know what, Jack? You have a 50% of getting diabetes based on your current health patterns. And then you go when you change your behavior, and maybe you can drop it to 30% because the artificial intelligence is able to look at the patterns and given your level of activity and your dietary input and so on, it's able to make an accurate prediction of your chance of developing different chronic diseases. And that can change behaviors. But data gives us the chance to make better decisions. And ultimately, what we want to do is change the way we deliver healthcare. That's going to be the future of medicine, whereby the patient is at the center of the healthcare equation, not the institution or the healthcare network. So is there a way to take that remote monitoring, mix it with the artificial intelligence and deliver healthcare in a new way? Especially for chronic diseases, because as we know, we're all getting older. And medicine is doing a really great job of keeping everyone alive. 
So there's far more people alive now and living longer and healthier into their older age. And so we have this plethora of chronic diseases that now need management, which is a good thing. We just need to change the way we're managing it. So hospitals, as you know, that might have been built 50 years ago, which had 30 seats in the waiting room, which was enough for that population, that's completely redundant now where you have people standing because you need double the amount of seats. So there must be a better way of doing it, and there is. Traditionally centralized things like shopping, go to a department store, that's been changed to online. Banking, going to a bank, that's been changed to online. Health has been a bit slower to catch up with the idea of ICT, information communication technology, because we're afraid about our, our data being shared and being, being leaked. But as we know, if we can trust the internet for banking and so on, that there's some really good encryption methods there. So is there a way to take the remote monitoring, the artificial intelligence, and to actually deliver better healthcare? And there is. This is telemedicine, and it's already been used around the world and been used for a long time, but not really in the area of chronic diseases. So why is a patient coming from Clifton or from the Aran Islands or even from across Galway and spending an hour and a half coming to the clinic, 20 minutes parking, waiting two hours in a waiting room to see me for 10 minutes? That's a waste of everyone's resources and you don't need to be an engineer to figure out that's a pretty wasteful process for the environment and for the person's time. It's much better if, for example, the artificial intelligence can figure out which patients need to be seen. Maybe they're having a lot of low blood sugars if they're diabetic and it schedules them to have a virtual clinic with me. So at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, they get a link to log on to the clinic. I said in your pockets you have phones that have audiovisual equipment like FaceTime and Skype that are encrypted, so I can see you on the computer, and then I can see all your data, because all these meters, these glucose meters, now when you take a value, it goes to the cloud. So I can see your sugar data, I can see your activity data, and I can see your, your, um, your medication administration. And then we can have a very rich conversation, and I can say, as you would if you were beside me, I see every Tuesday afternoon you're going low, uh, but also I notice on Tuesday afternoon your activity goes up, what's going on? And then you might say, I've joined a, a walking club every Tuesday. And I say, ah, that makes sense, you better pull back on your, your mealtime insulin. So we can have rich conversations remotely, and it prevents people having to come in to a physical hospital. Now, you'll still have to come in at least once a year for a chronic disease to get, you know, the general medical exam, but a lot of the care can be delivered remotely. And it's these visits throughout the year which will keep people on track with their targets for chronic diseases. So, in summary, two things I hope you learned tonight from my talk. One, if your phone rings, always answer it. It could be NASA. <laughs> and two, the power of technology to improve the way that we deliver healthcare. That's the future of medicine. Thank you.